Next time someone says to you in a negotiation, fair, reasonable, unfair, unreasonable, realistic, unrealistic, ask them why. What is the underlying justification for their conclusion that is fair or reasonable or unfair or unreasonable? Okay, so in all your negotiations, you wanna go through those first two golden rules. Information is power, so get it. Maximize your leverage. You also wanna go through the third golden rule, employ fair objective criteria. Issue here is, what is fair and reasonable? Raise your hands, for instance, if you've ever heard to use the terms in a negotiation, fair, reasonable, unfair, unreasonable, realistic, unrealistic. Right, all of you, right? What does it mean? This is a fair amount for you to pay uh, for, this, uh, for this equipment. Or you know it'd be unfair and unreasonable for you to assume that that provision really ought to be in our agreement. What if any strategic information was shared with those statements? To me, zero, nada, nothing, zippo. The terms fair, the terms reasonable, the terms unfair, unreasonable, the terms realistic, unrealistic are conclusions. What you care about is what is the underlying justification for their conclusion that it's fair and reasonable. It's fair and reasonable because of some powerful independent standards. It's fair and reasonable because that's market value. Or it's unfair and unreasonable because it'd be unprecedented for us to include that provision in these types of deals. In fact, one of the questions up here related to what do you do when you've got precedent, right? Your, your, I think it was your uh, uh, question. You know, what are you going to do if you have a previous deal with them? Because it gives you a benchmark as to what might be appropriate to provide in that particular context. Or expert in scientific judgment power. How, how many of you use experts in your matters? I mean, many of you are experts in your matters, right? I mean, we're, we've, got, we've got engineers, we've got tax folks, we've got uh, uh, folks that really know the contours of these deals and the elements of those deals. Why, why do we use experts? By the way, if you're in HR, you use experts. If you're on the, uh, uh, you know, if you're dealing with uh, contractors and subcontractors, you're dealing with experts, we're value engineering deals. We use experts everywhere these days. Why do we use experts? trust. Why do we trust experts though? Why is it that when an expert says it's fair, it's reasonable, it's unfair, unreasonable, that we somehow just automatically believe them? I mean, why? Credibility. Credibility, that's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Because an expert presumably, you know, ha has a certain level of expertise and knowledge uh, in that particular environment. Uh, maybe they've written 12 books on the subject uh, or they have three letters after their last name. So when they draw a conclusion as to what's fair or unfair or reasonable or unreasonable, it's gonna be more likely to be believed in that context. Why else do we use experts? By the way, would you rather have an expert who's in-house, who works for this company, or would you rather have an expert uh, equally qualified, equally credible, who comes from outside the company? Which would you prefer to use in, a, in the context of a negotiation? Probably outside, now why is that? Why is that? Because that's right, because they're not biased, because they have the, they have the perception of independence. And that's the power of all of these standards because they have credibility, because here's a market value analysis. This is why it's fair and reasonable for us to pay this because everybody else in this market is paying something very similar. Or you know what? That was in our deal before, therefore it was fair and reasonable for you then, it should be fair and reasonable for you now. Or costs and profits power. How many of you think it's important if you're going to buy a new car to find out what the dealer actually paid? To find out the dealer's cost? Now, why do you care? I mean, really, why do you care? Because how much the markup is, because it gives you a little bit of a sense as to their profit margin, right? Figure, hey, if they pay $20,000 for the car, I'll offer you 21, right? $1,000 profit for you, and I know I'm getting a, a fair deal, a reasonable deal. Now, you need to be a little bit careful about that when you buy cars because sometimes dealers actually will accept less than what they paid 
And sometimes they're going to require you to pay sticker price plus. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say a couple years ago I wanted to buy one of those new Ford Mustangs. And a couple years ago when those new Ford Mustangs came out, they were pretty high demand. And let's say that, um, uh, what's your name? Zach. Zach. Uh, let's say Zach's a dealer. A car dealer. <laughs> Figure I better be explicit about this. So I go to Zach and I say, Zach, I'm interested in buying one of these new Ford Mustangs right next to you. And um, I've uh, done my homework, I've done my due diligence. And I know you're listing it for 30, but I know you're, you know, you, you paid $20,000 for it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer you 21, right? Thousand dollar profit for you and you're getting a, a fair deal, a reasonable deal. Um, now, right after those new Ford Mustangs came out, how is Zach gonna respond to my $21,000 offer? I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads. He's gonna laugh in my face. Now, why is he gonna laugh in my face? It's a fair deal, it's a reasonable deal. Zach says, you know what, Marty? I appreciate the fact that you did your homework. Yes, we paid $20,000 for it. Yes, we're listing it for 30, we're selling it for 40. I say, Zach, that's not fair, that's not reasonable. That's a, that's a $20,000 profit on one car. And you know what he says to me? He says, Marty, I don't care what's fair and reasonable because, because that's the market. Or he's gonna be real specific and he's gonna say, hey, Marty, turn around. See those 10 people lined up behind you? They all want this car. Oh, and by the way, he says, you can't get this car anywhere else. Now, Zach has shifted the negotiation from fair, reasonable, unfair, unreasonable, realistic, unrealistic, to what element of the negotiation process that we've already discussed this morning, or this afternoon? Leverage, that's exactly right. He's saying, hey Marty, I've got a plan B and a C and a D and an E and an F. Oh, and by the way, he says, you don't. He says, when he says, you can't get this car anywhere else, he's saying, you don't have a good plan B. Now, what am I saying? At the end of the day, I'd rather have a good plan B than a market value analysis. I'd rather have two vendors bidding than a magazine article that says, this is the appropriate amount to pay for this level of service. I'd rather have two job offers than a, a, a compensation expert uh, saying, this is an appropriate amount uh, in this environment for a benefit package or for a bonus. Now, I'm not saying that standards are unimportant. Standards are the language through which we engage in many negotiations. It's how we put that fair and reasonable hat on our head. So one of the questions up here was, how do you determine what's fair in the context of any negotiation? And we look at these types of standards, these types of benchmarks. Or by the way, if you really do have limited alternatives, and there's nothing you can do to change it, right? I got a bad plan B, they know it. They've got a great plan B and C and D, and I know it. If there's nothing you can do to change your leverage, here's my advice. Don't talk about leverage, talk about fair and reasonable. <laughs> right? I mean, if my house has been on the market for nine months, and all of a sudden I've got someone interested, I've got weak leverage. Let's say I've, I've accepted a job offer out of town. I'm gonna look, hey, here's my appraisal. In this appraisal, right, market value analysis, expert appraiser is saying, this is an appropriate amount to value this particular house in this market. Now, would I rather have three people bidding for my house? Yeah, but in the absence of it, I'm gonna focus on that appraisal. Or professional or industry standards power. Uh, by the way, does, does, uh, does, does the company have standard agreements with its, uh, with its vendors, with its counterparts? Yeah, of course you do, of course you do. Um, so I have standard two-page consulting agreement when I do negotiation consulting. And a couple years ago, I, uh, this guy wanted to hire me to help him sell a large piece of commercial real estate in Phoenix. And I handed him my standard two-page agreement. I said, please sign it, it's fair, it's reasonable. And he said, you know what, Marty, he said, he said, written agreements make me nervous. He said, I tell you what, why don't we just do this on a handshake? Don't you trust me? What should I say? Uh, no, I don't trust you. <laughs> Not a good way to start out a client relationship. I mean, really, what should I say? By the way, the guy was a used car dealer. <laughs> so what should I say? Okay, it's to, it's to protect both parties, right? Said, hey, part of the reason you're coming to me is because of my legal background, and I'm telling you from a legal perspective, it's good to have our rights and obligations and responsibilities defined in writing, 
right? If you walk out of here and you get hit by a bus, I'm protected. If I walk out of here and I get hit by a bus, you're protected. Oh, and by the way, if you go to any other negotiation consultant in the country, they're gonna have you sign this, sign this exact same contract. That's what the market's saying is appropriate. Oh, and <laughs> by the way, five years ago when I represented you in that other matter, you signed the same contract. It was fair for you then, it's fair for you now, right? That's precedent. Uh, you know, it'd be very inefficient and costly for you to hire a lawyer to negotiate with me over the terms of my standard contract. What am I doing? I'm combining these standards. And the combination of these standards increases their power, their force, their impact. Next time someone says to you in a negotiation, fair, reasonable, unfair, unreasonable, realistic, unrealistic, ask them why. What is the underlying justification for their conclusion that is fair or reasonable or unfair or unreasonable? One of the questions up here related to salary negotiations. When you are in a position, you like it, you're talking about a raise, you're talking about different job responsibilities, and you don't want to be so aggressive as to talk about plan Bs, right? That's sort of saying, I don't want to stay here. The best thing you can do is to find benchmarks. Find benchmarks, find standards that justify what you want. Okay, we're going to watch a quick uh, video clip now from Trish White. Uh, Trish White is the former dean of the law school at Arizona State uh, College of Law. Uh, she's the current dean at the University of Miami Law School. And she's going to share how she was used as an independent objective tax expert in the negotiations between the Major League Baseball players and the Major League Baseball owners a few years back just prior to the strike. I had the experience of being the tool that was the, which was being used to attempt to move the process forward uh, in conjunction with Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball players and the Major League Baseball owners despise each other probably about as much as any two groups can, or particularly they did in the years just preceding the strike. And in those years, part of what was involved was that the Players Association believed that owning a team yielded tax benefits uh, that were just enormous and that those tax benefits and the economic values of those tax benefits were not being properly reflected by the owners association when they were negotiating with the players association. Meanwhile, the owners association under no circumstance was prepared to share its tax returns or its financial data sufficiently to the Players Association, that the Players Association would be able to make a, a realistic uh, description of, or, or have a realistic understanding of those tax benefits, which in fact were not nearly as great as the Players Association believed, but the owners uh, could say they're not as great, but they had no credibility with, with the, uh, with the uh, Tax Association, uh, with the, um, the, the Players Association. Well, I was hired by both as a neutral tax professor, expert, to examine the financial records of the owners and of the teams and their tax returns, and then do an academic description without revealing any of that information, which would describe the magnitude of and the nature of the tax benefits. So what's Trish White talking about? Because she truly was independent, because she was paid by both sides, and because she had the credibility to draw a conclusion, she could reach a conclusion that both parties could accept and move the, party, uh, move the parties forward. By the way, when we talk about, one of the questions was talking about ethics. Uh, and sometimes that's related, obviously, to credibility. And sometimes having that type of credibility and that independence can oftentimes move the negotiation process forward. <laughs>